here we are. I think we got it. So welcome, Steve Burke. It is such a pleasure to have you with our live talk with Becky Chernick. That's me. Hello, Becky. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's it's a pleasure to have you. Now, to get things started for our dealers and viewers, and for those that may not know who I am, which I find that really hard to believe after all these posts and bazillion of posts about my upcoming event with Evani Master Series Forum, the Digital Age, April 6th and 7th. You got to be there because it's going to be absolutely amazing. And I have to tell you guys, I've been in the car business for a while. Now, Steve wants to make you believe that I'm 19, no, 21, 19 yeah, years old, 21, two years. <laughs> two years. So um, he's got a better way of saying that. But anyway, so I've been, a, I've been in the automotive industry for a, for a while. And, and what pleases me the most, what I really get a lot of, pa I'm passionate about is helping dealers really align their processes. Because you know what I really believe is that processes really do make a big difference in what we're doing in our dealerships from the time the customer lands on that dealership website to uh, when they get into the dealership, because you know what, they still like the brick and mortar experience. It's all about that. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. They just don't want to spend the entire day in the dealership buying a car. So it's from the time they get into that dealership to Desking, how are we desking that deal to finalizing that transaction in the FI department and really helping to build a better customer experience, also reoccurring customers. So it's not, as Steve Apicello says, the re, re it's not that micro moment with the menu presentation. It's all about getting that customer back time and time again. <clears throat> so that's what I'm all about. Anyway, so get things started. I have wanted, I got to have, I, I, I'm so excited to have Steve Burke here with us with Agora. And he's going to be talking about how we're revolutionizing the way capital funding is being done. So have at it, Steve Burke. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Becky. And like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. I love your introduction. I mean, you are definitely very talented. I'm kidding. Um, so anyway, you know, Agora Data, you know, we're, I'm, I'm Steve Burke, I'm the CEO of Agora Data, um, and we're just disrupting an entire market that really hasn't had any change or any disruption in at, at least 45 years that I know of. I've, like you, I'm 21 years old, I've been doing this for two years, <laughs> or the truth is I've been in this business for about 45 years, so seen a lot and, and very excited uh, to chat with all your listeners and, and um, answer any questions and tell you guys more about Agora Data. Well, it's really kind of exciting because I would say in the past, I don't know, maybe for me anyway, a year, six months <clears throat> that I've really been wrapping my head around how is AI changing the way, let's just first just keep it simple, talk about how AI is changing the way lenders actually work with car dealers in that they are help that it's not all about the FICO score. No. And yes. they're buying the the deal based off of different factors. So let's dive into that first. You know, I, I find it interesting when you mention FICO scores, because if you're in the super prime world and you have an 800 FICO, you know, you don't even need to look at FICO or anything else to know that that consumer, that customer is going to pay for the car. I mean, you know, they're super prime, right? And then when you start getting, dropping down a little bit into maybe prime and near prime, you know, FICO has some relevance, but when you start really dropping down into the non-prime or the subprime world, um, FICO just doesn't have a really strong correlation to defaults and and we use artificial intelligence and machine learning um, more unique, I would say, than a lot of other shops that are doing it. And, and what that actually does for lending, it, um, the way I like to describe it to people is in the old days of scorecards or just strictly looking at a FICO, you were directionally correct. You know, you had an axe and you were throwing an axe and you would hit the target. And now with, with a lot of the new technologies, 
and using some really cool and radical artificial intelligence and machine learning, instead of that ax, you now have a scalpel and you could price much more fairly. You could approve more loans and it just opens up, you know, a treasure chest of things that you can do for consumers, for your dealerships, for your finance companies. And it's just exciting times. Well, I think it's not only exciting times, it's, it, it really gives us a lot of different options that we just didn't have before. So, you know, I know it's a win-win for the customer, for the dealer, and also for capital, for that much matter, all coming together. Do I have that kind of, do I have that right? How, how that's kind of making this all come together? Yeah, I mean, when we started Agora, we started it by looking at a win, 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 win. So we added a fourth win, right? Okay. So we, we we looked at it where the dealers, and this is not necessarily in any order, but the dealers have to win, right? They should be able to sell more cars, finance more cars, and book better profits, or at least much more predictable profits. You know, the second win um, that we're able to bring through AI and machine learning is the consumer can win. Consumers can get better interest rates, lower loan to values and better terms, you know, that actually fit that consumer. The third win is we now bring the capital markets, Wall Street money to the auto dealer and finance company community. So it's a win for the capital markets, too, because they've always wanted to be connected you know, to car dealers and, and finance companies. And then obviously it's a win for Agora because if everybody else is doing well and winning, you know, so are we. So it's a win-win, win-win situation. Well, you know, I like the idea and I'll date myself a little bit. When <laughs> years ago, we used to really have dealers got a little bit <clears throat> involved in this buy your pay your kind of in-house financing. And there was a lot more buy-in with regard to bringing that in-house. And then, of course, with the financial crisis, everything else, it was, and then, of course, trying to sell your dealerships and mergers and acquisitions. We didn't want the risk on the books, things like that. And they got away from doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, today, we may have a better way of or dealers may have a better way to manage that business. And it might be an appropriate time to consider doing that. I don't know. No, no, 100% right. I mean, you know, with, with Agora, you know, we, we like to say that we provide a captive finance company sort of in a box. So, you know, if you think about some of the recent news out there with, you know, Carvana and Auto Nations and Penske, you know, all looking to build their captives. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nothing new. I mean, they want to do it and they want to do it not for their prime paper because prime paper really needs to go to banks. I mean, you can't, uh, only banks and credit unions can afford to lend at one or 2% right. you know, APRs. But everything else, you know, anything else that has any kind of yield on it, dealers today should not be giving up their customers. They should keep that all in house and then, when it's in house, think of all the the, the ancillary stuff that, that could be sold, all the insurance products and warranties, and 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 now you have a dealer that actually controls, you know, when they approve a loan, when they sell a car, what they sell, what the terms are, what products they sell. It's, it's just full control. And and there's no reason in this day and age uh, with all the technology. And especially with the capital that we provide to ever sell your loan. Well, you know that. Okay, so does that get and I, does that get a bit risky? I mean, for a dealer to really think about bringing that in house and holding that kind of business, can they? What are can they handle it? Can they? Edmund through that. And I think Agora, I think there's something else going on with you that you're helping a dealer to, to manage that book of business. How does that, that work? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the S word for us is not Steve, it's securitization. We, <laughs> we invented, uh, we did the first, the world's first ever done crowdsourced auto subprime securitization 
back in um, December of 2020. And really what we did when we when we started Agora was a, our mission was just to empower loan originators with this elegant and abundant, you know, and, and, and very affordable capital. And where is that elegant, abundant, and affordable capital? It's on Wall Street. It's in the capital markets. All the largest companies out there, largest finance companies, all the captives, the Nissans and the Toyotas, they all get their money from the capital markets. So we set out to, and we invented the connection of bringing that capital, that beautiful capital, to every car dealer any finance company out there. So, so first from a risk standpoint, it's very affordable capital, but, it, and, and not to get into too many details, it's also non-recourse debt. Wow. So, so it's, it's really structured in, in a way that, that there's very little risk, I mean, in very little risk, but full upside potential. And then, you know, to further that, the tools, the technology, that we deliver. And if it's not Agora, you know, any dealer should be seeking some really advanced analytics to be able to understand what they're doing. And if you have the capital and the analytics, it's very safe to, to hold your own loans and to be that captive finance company. And then on top of it, we provide all the loan servicing. So for a dealer, they're really not changing their business model much other than keeping all that upside potential. So we do have some comments. I'm not exactly sure what come here. We are, we've got a few, we got Larry. Hey, good evening, Larry. I'm so glad you were here. Um, um, here with us tonight. And then Larry Feldman, I've got two Larry's coming on tonight and, uh, Larry Feldman, glad that you're here and always a pleasure. And then of course, Larry, good evening, Larry. I'm glad you're here. And, so I think that um, this, pull, for me, the way I look at this and what you're offering isn't all that much different to dealers holding their own insurance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's the difference is, you know, we had direct and then, of course, they got away from direct and it was pro rata and then they got away from pro rata and they got a little bit more okay, well, I can hold on to more. And then we got into reinsurance, CFCs, NAC, NFS, I forgot. Anyway, that book of business. And then of course, then there's the DOWCs. And <coughs> of course, now you got first extended and some of these others. So, you know, part of that was like, oh my gosh, I've got um, first extended and you know, you're really getting radical there. You know, um, these guys, once you get hooked on, you know, owning that business, you are, you're, you're done. It's like, it's, it's like Kool-Aid. I mean, it's hard to get off of it or somebody else said something else, but like a drug and hard, hard to get off of it. But I think that some of these dealers have done a really good job with it. And Absolutely. I feel, I feel like what you're talking about is very similar minded. I mean, it's their book of business that they're managing, that they're making um, their, it, it's their ability to utilize for other things. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, think right. about it, Becky. So in the, and I'm by far, and you're much more of an expert in the insurance world than I am, but I you know, <laughs> when, when you have insurance risk and you sell that whole, all that risk off, you, you, whether it's, an, let's say, an extended service contract, right? And you collect a premium, you sell the, the, con, you know, the extended service contract, and then it's through somebody else. You have no upside. You booked whatever you booked and you, you took your profit that day. You know, in the reinsurance world and, and other ways of doing it, you, you have all that upside potential. You have limited downside and you have all that upside potential. No different than if you're doing a, an indirect point of sale loan. When you create an indirect point of sale loan, let's say you sell a car to Steve Berg and make believe I'm not a prime customer and you charge me, you know, 18% interest and an LTV of 140%, then you take that loan, that retail contract, and you sell it to someone else. Well, that's some person, that bank, that finance company you're selling that loan to is making money on the loan. Otherwise, they wouldn't be buying it. Well, if you have the same capital structure 
as, as that finance company or bank that you're selling the loan to, why not keep that upside? And, and we protect the downside risk. So, you know, and, and like I said, that's a much longer conversation, but you have full upside potential, limited downside risk. And that's no different than the insurance or the reinsurance world. Well, I think that if dealers, you know, didn't go ahead and take a look at that as a way to go ahead and grow their business opportunity, especially now with all this um, activity going on, mergers and acquisitions and things like mm -hmm. that, growth um, potential. Um, I have a question, and this, this normally gets a, a bit lo uh, longer and may full fill up the entire screen. So if we will. Um, so Steven Apicella, thank you so much for being here. Every customer matters to our industry success, especially beyond the one-time transaction. So delivering solutions before and after the sale that secures more customers and strengthens the dealer's financial position. Hmm. <clears throat> is where we all need to be as solution providers. So when a deal is good for everyone, including the customer, then we're building on long-term success beyond short-term gains. Yes. And then we've got, real quick, Ted Ings is on. Batman is here to save the day. And then, hello, Steve, Ted Ings. Do you know Ted Ings? I don't I, know if he's saying hi to you or if he's hi, saying hi <laughs> hello, to Steve. How are you? <laughs> but... Um, a terrific but Becky, guy before standing. you do that, just go back to what Steve said. I mean, he's okay. 100% right. I mean, you know, it is a, like I said, that's why I said it's a win, 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 win. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really big on, on believing that we need to push as much fair lending as possible. Okay. And, and when dealers are, I'm going to use the term, buying their money at a lower cost, you know, we're hoping that some of that cost also gets passed along to the consumer. Because when it does in the subprime world and, and the loans are underwritten, I, I don't want to say fair, in, in a more favorable way for performance, everybody wins. You know, the customer doesn't default, the dealer collects more money, you know, so it's just a win-win for everybody. So, so we like to see things passed through to the consumer wherever possible as well. But great point, Stephen. I mean, that's, you know, it, it has to be a win-win for everybody, including the customer. Oh, definitely. And see, one of the things that's happening, especially with what's going on in the industry, I mean, what's going to happen in two years right now? How do you see this used car market playing out? You um, know, it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting. I mean, so, and, and I know, you know, in your opening, you talked about bricks and mortar and all that, and that's 100% true. I mean, people still like bricks and mortar and be able to, you know, kick the tires, so to speak, and not spend all day in a dealership. Nobody likes that including the dealers and the F&I guys. But, you know, I, I think I've seen more change in the last two years than I've seen in the last 45 years. A lot of it has to do with um, companies like ours and there's others that have developed these really great, you know, very scalpel-like tools. Um, but then also your online retailers. I mean, they are, they are your dealer next door these days. So if you have your bricks and mortar shop, you know, the Carvanas and the Vrooms are next door to you and, and are eating into your market share. So, you know, to me, you have to build that moat around your dealership and figure out, you know, how do you protect, you know, your dealership or protect your franchise? Um, even if you're a used car dealer, I mean, franchise is a business. How do you protect that? And, and to me, it starts with having the right analytics, the right tools, but definitely the right capital structure. You know, these billion dollar online retailers, they have capital, right? They may not be making money, but they got a lot of money to spend. They have a lot of money for advertising. They have nice inventory. So competing with that, you have to have the capital as well. And that, that's what Agora, Agora provides or a capital provider and a technology provider. But even if it's not Agora, because I don't want to make this salesy, you know, Dealers to protect themselves and protect their franchises need to be able to compete with what's happening these days with online retailers. 
They really do. I mean, it's not going away anytime soon, that's for sure. But one of the things I want to go back a little bit on that comment that you, Steve and you made. And, you know, one of the things I know you and I talked about was my thing has always been, why aren't we doing a better job taking care of the customer as it pertains? And, and I've always felt this way. <laughs> you know, um, I've always wanted to take a customer who had some slow pay history subprime credit, whatever. And I wanted to always put them in a good situation, in a better situation, as much as a better situation. I wanted to get them off the lot, the buyer. And, and the buyer pay here has its thing. But I would much rather get them into a new car, some sort of a, if it's not a car, new car, but a pre-owned vehicle that it, it, it's going to, you know, it's going to do them well. But to get out from under that, into another vehicle two or three years later. The idea is to get more customers, right? Repeat <clears throat> customers is your best customer. And especially non-prime, subprime customers are just that much more loyal. So why is it that in your opinion, I know what my opinion is, but I would feel that that is a customer that I'd want to go ahead and take and support and get them in the best situation as we possibly can. So that way we get that customer coming back after time at, and time again. Yeah, no, I mean, hundred percent right. You know, I, I believe that everybody is born prime. So they start off prime, right? And then something happens and they become not prime. Then something else happens and they become subprime. And once they hit that subprime, it's very hard to get out of that because generally they're paying a higher interest rate for everything they buy. Even if it's not autos, they're, they're generally paying more for almost everything. So, you know, there, there are tools, we have tools, others have it um, to really break that cycle for that consumer and, and get them out of it. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, we, we have tools that will, will, will show a dealer how to originate a loan that will be at a lower loan to value, a lower APR, and the dealer will make more money. And the consumer gets a better deal. Right. And the consumer has more options. So if the car breaks down, maybe they're not as buried in it and they could trade it in, you know, or they can sell it. You know, sometimes, you know, consumers in, in the very deep subprime world can't get out of the car. So if it needs, you know, two thousand dollars worth of repairs. All they could do is park it on the street or return it to the dealer and they don't have any option because they may not have the money for the repairs. So there's lots of lots of stuff that we have here at Agora that really um, underwrites those loans to get the consumer out of that cycle. Well, you know, some of the dealers also offer, you know, you've got. You know, because some of the lenders are not going to buy the, the you know, the, the loan to value only goes so much, right? And so the back end products, and especially which surprises me as our service contracts and, you know, some of these, you know, value added products that really do make a difference. So if in the event the customer is back in service, um, at least we're able to take care of that customer. Right. And, and so... I'm going to get to Steven in a minute, but I'm just saying that. All right. So then there's the other, other finance companies that you utilize to offer those additional products because we can't include them into the finance contract. So wouldn't it just be better just to not do that, but also to have the ability to, to <clears throat> um, add that value 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 product into their financing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because of course. these other outside finance companies are charging an arm and a leg to that customer. So now you have a car payment, but on top of it, you have another car, uh, a payment to afford the service contract or other ancillary products. So what sense does that make? If I could put it in one finance option, and be able to offer the customer an affordable payment in term. Mm -hmm. term. So, so building a captive, a true 
captive finance company sort of in a box for a dealership. Let's say you have a Chevy dealership or, or Joe's used cars and you want to have your own captive finance company. You know, let, let's, let's not say buy here, pay here. Let's say really a captive finance company. Okay. And, and what does that mean? That means that you make the decision, you being the dealer makes the decision on the credit, on the underwriting. And again, in a captive, we're supplying because it's captive in a box, lots of tools to do that. But the, the decision on how to do that sits with the dealer or the F&I guy. The product you want to sell sits with the dealer and the F&I guy. The decisions are made by the dealer or the F&I person, not by another finance company saying, you know, your line five on your contract cannot exceed whatever. It's now up to the dealer because it's a captive finance company that we built for them. So if the dealer wants to subvent their sales somehow by, by maybe offering lower rates, they can. If a dealer wants to, you know, add more product, they can. And it's totally up to them. So we remove by putting that, building that captive in the box, we put that credit decision, that that's sell or not sell decision at the local level. The car dealer makes it. It's no longer getting approval from someone else to do something. It's up to the dealership. We provide the technology to do that. We also provide the capital to do that. And we provide the loan servicing to do it. So it's a full of a, 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 just a total captive finance company. Dealer focuses on buying cars, merchandising and marketing the cars, reconditioning the cars, selling the cars, selling product, and doesn't have to worry about the financing. It's completely handled. So let's take a look what Stephen has to say now. Um, customers embrace the good and broadcast the bad. Oh, that's for sure. Earn the reoccurring customer or fuel the negative customer sentiment that exists. Each moment, either our industry is part of the long-term solution or part of the long-standing problems. And I think a lot of it is just the lack of maybe not understanding as what's going on, um, how really to embrace this. I mean, a lot of changes. I mean, we have gone, I mean, dealers have gone through so much change. Would you say, I mean, just in two years, I know you talked a little bit about that before, <clears throat> but in two years, just with this COVID, I know, I know what I've been through <laughs> and I know some of what dealers have been through with regard to, you know, how they have to embrace, um, the, the ability to offer customers or, to bring in some of this in-house financing and taking advantage of that capital. Um, yeah, I mean, TC oh, by the way, so Stephen, my uh, three kids went to TCU, <laughs> not me. But anyway, make a long story short, look, customer service is always front and center and the most important thing for any, for any business, especially for a car dealership. I mean, you know, back in the day when I was a car dealer, you know, I, I, I made it a practice not to set, sell cars to friends and relatives because inevitably those are the ones that broke down and, and I just couldn't do that. So customer service is everything. Forget money, forget loan terms. You know, it costs a whole bunch of money to acquire a customer, especially these days when you're really competing with online retailers, right? So it costs a bunch of money to acquire that customer. If dealers aren't taking care of those customers, nothing else matters. So customer service, you know, Stephen's right. I mean, they will broadcast the bad. When people do reviews, they tend to do more negative reviews than going on and saying, wow, I bought a car from Joe and it was great. You know, they tend to do the negative, right? So customer service is everything. I mean, 100%. That, our, our drive here at Agora is... We don't call our dealers or finance companies customers, they're members, um, you know, so that, that's how we view them. They're members on our platform. It's, it's not necessarily a customer. Um, so I, I think that it's very important to provide great customer service. Well, I, I've always believed in that. Mike, um, Tom Thompson, I, I always end with that, I don't know, hopefully not pronounce the P. 
because it's not. And, Hi, and Mike, yeah, that's just really smart. Um, anyway, so Mike, good to see you. I'm glad you're here. But I feel <clears throat> like, you know, and I've had shows, um, Steve, with regard to subprime. And, and there's this, there's this tendency out there that this subprime customer is probably, you know, lucky they're, that they're able to buy a car. And, you know, here's the deal. We're going to, you're, you're going to go ahead and you're going to take, you're going to take this loan. However, which way we, 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 we dish it up to you. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've always cringed on that because I never, I never, that's not how I felt. I fe I always feel as if, you know, bad things happen to good people all the time. And we have to do our due diligence to do whatever that it takes to put them in the best situation that we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I'm also of the understanding and there are some that disagree with me, but their, 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 their thinking is like subprime hangs out with subprime. And, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, that's not <clears throat> true at all. If I take care of that customer. They're going home. They're talking to family. They're talking to other people that they know and saying, you know what? I can't begin to tell you the experience that I had at this store and how they treated me. I know mm -hmm. I don't have the best credit. I know I messed up, but they did everything that they could to put me in the best situation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Becky's. Headings, he says. Okay. Customer, customer service is king. king. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, subprime customers are human beings. They're no different than you and I. They've had some circumstances happen in their lives. Prime people become subprime customers. Yeah, okay. Subprime customers can get out of that and get back to, you know, being prime. But they're they're human beings. And you know, when I when I started my first finance company, it was a subprime finance company, and and I'll never forget that. Um, I had to, we were buying indirect paper from mostly franchise stores and none of the franchise stores ever believed that they had subprime customers. This is way back in the day and they didn't have subprime customers coming to them. So myself and a bunch of other guys, all familiar names to everybody probably on this call started the NAF association. And, mm -hmm. and it was really started to, to, to make people understand that subprime is no different than prime. It's just, you know, a, 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 a let's call it a weaker credit grade, but it's still people buying cars that have families that refer other customers. Those customers may be subprime. They may be prime. I don't believe it's true that subprime customers hang out with subprime people. <laughs> I don't, I don't believe that's true. Um, but, but a subprime customer can actually be being treated right. Think about this. If you're prime, you go into a dealership, you know exactly what you're doing, sign here, leave with the car, right? You don't really appreciate it that much. If you're a subprime customer and you go into a dealership, you're afraid you're going to be turned down to start with the customer, right? Now they get approved and they get treated right. You've earned a customer for life and you've earned their entire family and friends, you know, and, and, you know, it's not expensive to acquire customers when they're coming in because they're referred to you. Yeah. And, and it's so important, you know, treat them right. Subcom customers. Are I've always had, you know, every time I treated a customer, I mean, non-prime, subprime, whatever you want to call it, believe me when I tell you, I always had heart and passion and I was going to do everything that I could. And you know what? Those are the customers that come walking back in with a bottle of wine. Hey, Beck, I got this for you. Hey, Beck, I've got, you know, a box of chocolate. I'm like, well, isn't that awesome? <laughs> but they're the ones that are always coming back with, the, you know, maybe not wine, some cookies. And um, but they're so grateful. They're so appreciative. Mm -hmm. um, so in Angela Schultz will say, you never know where someone has been or what they might have gone through. Be kind, help with your heart. Amen, Angela. That's exactly how, you know, I always felt and it always did me good, you know, to treat someone, you know, that, you know, just 
everybody has has been there and done it. Um, I can tell you. How about that financial crisis? Let me tell you. You, you know what's funny though, Angela. Uh, Angela, <laughs> Becky. Oh, Nick, you know what's funny? <laughs> um, that the reason why I started Agora was yeah. because car dealers and small finance companies are treated by banks as subprime customers. So, you know, you, you think about it, you know, I like to tell this story that when I was a car dealer way back when in the eighties, now I'm really dating myself. I said I was 21, but I'm talking about in the 1980s, I needed to borrow more money. And I went to a bank to borrow money. It was bank one at the time and they turned me down. And I asked them, why are you turning me down? You know, I have good credit, I have good financials. And they turned me down and they said, because we don't lend money to car dealers. So I said, okay, you know, and I went to another bank and I had trouble too. And then when I sold my car business and I opened my first finance company, the first bank that was there to lend me money, bank one. <laughs> and they were throwing a ton of money at me because I was the same person. Just now I'm a finance company instead of a car dealership. So so, you know, car dealers are not, they're underbanked. They're not treated, you know, fairly. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we started Agora was, was to bring that very elegant capital, that abundant and affordable capital to the car dealer community, just like large institutions have. Well, so that's what, you know, what I really appreciated about Agora and you, um, I've known you for some time and, you know, um, I know Jim Bass as well. And I remember when you guys first got started and I've always loved Jim and, you know, um, at the NAF conferences and we've always had a great time. And if not there, then of course, NADA, um, you know, Jim has always, I, I don't know, I've always gravitated towards those guys from Hudson and Cook and, you know, um, Jack Tracy as well. And good guy. And I'll, I'll, I will have to tell you one day, maybe not today about our, 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 the time at the restaurant at T.O. Peppy's. It was probably one of the best times of my life anyway. So good people, but that's what it's really all about is, you know, building that business and <clears throat> making sure we have customers coming back and, you know, and, and, and just kind of feeling, mm -hmm. I think for the most part, there are car people out there that feel the same way as I do. Angela Schultz, let's, um, Tom, um, is also saying, um, are we chasing a deal or are we chasing a customer? The 500 to 550 guy is just as valuable to me as is the 800 guy, probably more. <laughs> sometimes. Um, you know, a deal is a deal is a deal. It takes a little bit more effort, obviously, but in the end, the dealer who takes care of the subprime buyer is going to have the customer for life who mm -hmm. you then can bring along in service and watch their credit grow and turn them into a lifelong referral bank. Amen. Yeah. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. I mean, it really is. And, you know, I just, you know, it, it's, ironic because when I had this event, it probably was five years ago when we were talking about the subprime customer. And I was so, I mean, it went viral, this mm -hmm. conversation. And I had so many that said, no, you know, these guys have it coming. They can't pay their bills. Oh, too bad. You know, they're going to get what they get and that's it. And I'm like, I can't believe that you know, I'm hearing that. That is just <clears throat> absolutely just bizarre to me. So, um, Chris, ha, Chris, uh, Becky, subprime cl clients are always more appreciative. Yes. So I remember the first subprime deal I did back in 2003. The client showed up the next day in tears with, told you, got my bottle of wine. I'm with yeah. you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was amazing. Cookies, freaking chocolate. I mean, they're so appreciative. They're also so much more resilient too. you know, back in yeah. 2008 during our recession, um, the defaults increased much more in the prime space than in the subprime space. I mean, it's, you know, I've been telling, I've been in banking a lot of my career as well. And I would always tell regulators that subprime was actually the, the safer bet than prime Ooh. because, because, you know, subprime customers, they're very resilient and, and, you know, I, I forget who said it, but on the loyalty side, 
you know, when you, when you treat them right and um, give them great customer service, you have a customer for life and you have their family and their friends. So we have a Facebook user. I don't know their name, but you do. And if you want to share your name with me, um, you do have to stay in touch with your customers and they need to be treated with respect and you and will be customers for life plus all of their family and friends. What a great show. Yay. Um, because I think this is, this is really important for me because I, I feel like we, we don't do enough to bring cust to, 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 to work with that customer. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I guess you might want to call me a 21 year old who is old school. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the 21, but I'm old school. And I love to get out there, meet with a customer, you know, especially even when the desk has put this deal together and it's like, you know what, let me have at it let me have at it. I'm going to look at this deal and I'm going to get involved. I'm going to engage with this customer. I'm going to figure out, you know, is there a better way to go? And there's always a better way to go. Steve, if I can tell you how many times, and I know some of the guys here, Angela, <clears throat> um, Chris, you all know what I'm talking about. How many times has it been when you looked at a credit application, we just were the credit report and we're like, Oh, this is a freaking mess. I mean, Oh my God, they don't pay anyone. But I go out there, go meet the customer. You find out the story to put this together to make sense. That's what it, that's what FNI does. That is our responsibility, in my opinion, is to really be the to to be out there to have the talent to find out how can we make this happen. Can you imagine if we had more of that and had dealerships? where or the dealer having the capital to help to put this together it would be amazing awesome don't want to burst your bubble but we now oh, do we that go. with ai oh so we can instead of you know in the old days i used to love sitting across the desk from a customer talking with them learning about them you know and then structuring a deal that would make sense for them that's right and 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 and, and i was pretty good at being able to sit there one-on-one -on -one with someone and know you know if they're going to pay if they're not going to pay you know if I, am i selling them the right car is the payment too high and you know all that but now we do that with with some really cool machine learning we've we've got models for that that are scary heck now you're not trying I mean, to replace us are you uh no 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 we still need human beings to do a lot of things, but we've built these models with many billions of dollars of loan data that we've been able to um, understand how the loan started, how it ended when it's fully liquidated, and then duplicate that time in and time out. And, you know, I could tell you our models, no such thing as 100%, we're 98.5% accurate on cash flow, on losses. I mean, we run some really cool modeling that does all that. And it's done in nanoseconds now. So it's, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. I love that. So that's, that's, I mean, I take, you know, this is what I, what I talk about. I talk about, we have all this technology and that's okay. As long as we're, it, we know how to leverage it to mm -hmm. be able to get what we, you know, to, to maximize results and, look at the, look at what you're able to do. This is significantly reduces a tremendous amount of risk. And frankly, you know, I don't care. You want to call it a widget, whatever you want to call it. But if it's putting that such that particular deal in a better situation, why the heck not? So we have some comments here. Have to go through. Um, love that. Thank you, Cart. Thank you, Carts. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, they know the opportunity and behind the scenes work done to get them into the, absolutely. I think we don't do enough with that. Um, I've heard a few others in the industry getting back to writing a card to a client and saying, Hey, uh, or you're probably saying that you're receiving more thank you cards, but I also say, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Um, dealerships do not, they need to be an overhaul in the industry. Customer service. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Personal customer. touch of a handwritten card 
I know when I get one, I get a handwritten card. It goes a long way. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying you probably, I, I, I just, yeah, I was, I wasn't thinking right, but you're right. You, I've received more cards from customers that were so thankful because we got them out of tough situation. I can tell you back in the day, we were able to go ahead. And for me, I was able to take a customer out of a really bad situation, get some security deposits along the way <laughs> and put them into a lease. Much better situation, right? Because <clears throat> frankly, after two years, they were able to get out and, and, and we were able to put them in a, another car altogether. Um, that really helped to fit their budget. You know, Becky, what we do is not just subprime, right? So we look at the very, very deep subprime to the, let's call it near prime world. So, you know, when you get out of that near prime into the prime space, it's really a bank or a credit union, right? Any car dealer should be originating that loan and selling it to a finance company, or excuse me, to a bank or a credit union. But everything below that is where we have data analytics and we provide capital. So it could be your deepest of subprime to your very close to prime that that bank just won't buy or buy it. Well, or won't buy and give you a good rate on. Correct. So like you and I talked about this, you know, when, you know, there was that financial crisis and I can tell you, there were a lot of good people that went down and got hit hard because of it. They just did. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought, gosh, that was the time for dealers to go ahead and do in-house financing because these poor customers were getting hit and left with the higher interest rates um, in order to get out and buy a new car. And I'm thinking, dealers, I mean, this is the time to go ahead and, you know, provide that customer with a better way to go and probably little to no risk in that type of business. You know, it's like, like I said on one of your, uh, on the recorded session that we did a while back, that dealers, I, I learned a new word in business, moat, M-O-A-T, had to Google it to see what it actually meant for business. But it's literally like you have a castle and you have a moat with alligators around it. So, you know, when you, when you think of a car dealership, you know, what's your moat? How do you protect your dealership? How do you keep or grow your market share in an environment where online retailers have billions of dollars. And, and to me, it really starts with, you know, keeping that customer. So you sell them a car, keep the customer, keep them in house. You know, if there's other products or other services they need in the future, they are your customer, you know, don't sell your customer, keep your customer. And, and that will help you keep market share. As soon as you sell that customer, somebody else is soliciting them for whatever, right? And they're no longer your customer. You may have sold them the car, but now they're the customer of a finance company or a bank or whomever that has their own, you know, proprietary things they may be selling or, or methods they're using or referring them to other dealerships to buy cars. Keep the customer. That, that's how you're going to keep your market share. So Chris says, yes, it's the responsibility of F&I to get the client's story and to sell it to the bank. When working with subprime clients, it's wonderful opportunity to help guide them and get their credit back on track. It's amazing how quickly someone can turn their credit around if someone actually spends the time really to help them guide them. I, I, I agree. And I, and I understand where you're coming from with this, because we're not just talking about deep, deep subprime. Even then, maybe you sell that to somebody else, but we're talking about, you know, that, that type customer where again, they could maybe not get the best financing terms for whatever reason, and still even be in that near prime to, you know, subprime, um, category. So this is something that a dealer, you know, if I can give a customer a better way to go, a rate and or offering a better interest rate plus offering other products that would, you know, help protect them in a way that if in the event they should have a repair, you know, a year or so down the road that they're protected as opposed to some of these interest, some of these loans, I mean, they just can't afford the, the to include that value out of product. Does that, would that make sense in some cases? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Beck, Becky, we have um, thousands of members on our platform, and we actually, even the deepest of subprime, the buy here, pay here dealers, you know, we have a whole bunch of buy here, pay here dealers that we do business course, with, yeah. and we've now gotten it with them where they're able to sell cars with lower loan to values and lower APRs to, to buy here, pay here customers, mm -hmm. because the dealers are now from us getting their capital at a much lower cost and getting a lot of the technology and the guidance that we provide. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the deepest of subprime, you know, there are still ways of originating those loans with product and originating those loans at, at very reasonable interest rates and LTVs, and the dealers can make a lot of money doing that. Can I ask you a question? You, you and I talked about, and I didn't, <clears throat> and maybe I picked it up wrong. And um, mm -hmm. are you integrating, are you guys integrating with, um, with uh, dealer track? Yeah, we are What's going on with that. We are, we have some products coming out. Some I can talk about some I can't, but okay. we have okay. some, I, we're, I think... we're, we're a FinTech company, right? So we have a roadmap filled with, with some really cool technology that's coming out for dealers, but we, we will have um, a, a portal open soon that will simulate indirect or point of sale paper, but still building that captive finance company for dealers. That's that's slick. I, yeah. I really like that a lot. So I just wanted to let you guys know if in the event you have interest in really wanting to get more details on this, feel free to uh, certainly email me at Becky, B-E-C-K-Y and Chernick, C-H-E-R-N-E-K uh, dot com. <laughs> so Becky, Chernick Consulting dot com. Stephen Apicella, um, yeah, the modern day handwritten card is personalized push notification to customer smartphone that says, thank you for buying a vehicle from us. We know you had a choice. Yes, absolutely. All day long, getting back in front of that customer is ideal. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to being on this journey with you. And it certainly puts a clear stake in the ground. Selling your customers a vehicle wasn't the end of the journey. And you know, that's something that he really hits on hard. If you know anything mm -hmm. about Steven, it's everything is a pre-sale, during, and after. It's just not in that micro moment. And that's what dealers have to get away from thinking about. It's just not that one time. It's what are we doing that one time to affect yeah. what's happening with that customer to get that customer back in the dealership to sell them another car. And, and that's great with a text because, you know, if I was doing a handwritten note and sending it to someone, it would not be legible based on my handwriting anyway. So a text is, is, is definitely the way to go, but it's, it's being able to say, thank you. Too many times people just don't say thank you anymore or, or aren't very appreciative of the business. And you really need to be, people do have choice these days. I don't care if you're subprime, prime, super prime, you know, people have choice and, you know, soon you're going to see these large online retailers, you know, digging down deep into, you know, the, the lower credit tiers. Um, it's naturally going to happen. Um, and, you know, it'll be full spectrum at that point. So saying thank you and appreciating a customer is, is first and foremost. And I, I, I will say that, yeah, I mean, things are changing. We have to do a better job being more innovative. I mean, we just do. And if in fact you want to go ahead and maintain that market share or even have more of that market share, lion's share, as you say, Steve, I mean, you just got to, you just got to play it right. You got to, you got to wrap your head around this because this is what is going to increase your growth potential, but keeping your head and, or keeping your eyes and your ears shut down, keep doing mm -hmm. what you've always been doing does not go ahead and, and when um, today. And so um, let's hit what Angela has to say. And then I have a, I have a couple questions because we're, you know, um, we're like almost up in time. I can't even believe it has been an hour. I can't even get over it. I hate to say it, but I speak from firsthand experience. Uh, young owners, kids taking over have no idea of old school customer service and the importance of 
such that customer. Now it's the dollar golf, 40 hour work week. It's so different now. What do you have to say about that, Steve? Um, you know, I guess we, we work with, you know, first generation, second generation and third generation car dealers. Um, I, I think when, when it gets to the younger owners that are taking over, I think the one thing that I have noticed is they embrace technology. Yeah. And if they use the right tech technology, you know, um, it could it could provide great customer service as well. It, there's still nothing that could replace a human to human interaction, saying thank you, shaking hands, sending a text. But with with technology these days, I, I see some of the younger generation really embracing that, and it could be very powerful. But great yeah. point, Angela. You're right on, on on you know a bunch of that. I think it's, I think that what we have to understand is that the, <clears throat> is that there's some good technology out there and, and what we want to do is utilize it to our advantage. I think we get concerned thinking they're trying to take, you know, the role of the FNI person or the role of the deal or not the dealer, but the manager out of the equation. And that's really not the case. Um, and if, in fact, we can utilize those technologies that you offer, it really is just going to help us, you know, um, actually be more efficient with our customers. Yeah, to me, the technology that I'm referring to, Becky, and you hit it on the head, is, is creating efficiencies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, creating a better deal for the consumer by using those technologies, all right? And, and that creates that win-win. The dealer still makes good money. The consumer gets a better deal. Now, it's gonna take that human touch of thanking them and you know being there. You can't ever replace that. No, and I don't think customers want that. I don't. No. I think that, you know, from, you know, they do wanna be able to kind of figure out the terms earlier on, just get an idea even. Some, you know, some customers don't even want to go through the entire digital journey to finalizing the transaction. They just mm -hmm. want to feel like they're in control. Okay. Absolutely. So let them have it. Who cares? You know, I'd much rather have that information earlier on to determine what's the customer's credit criteria before they even make their way into the dealership. I mean, what is up with that? I definitely want to make sure that I have more information is, is just just makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Um, 700 credit is also going to be um, presenting on April 6th and 7th at the F&I Master Series Forum. And that's what they talk about. They talk about credit first versus credit last. I'm, I've always been an advocate of that. However, which way I can position my customer in the best way is just smart. Just smart. And if I'm so utilizing true. the dealership capital to, to make that happen even smarter, and if in the event we have or they have access to having Agora um, helping them to manage that business, right, and or to determine loan origination and know what those decision and how to track that decision through can make for better, um, better results, right? better decisions. Oh, and a better experience for everybody. Yay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm excited about Agora. I'm excited um, that you were able to be here and also to talk more on what's going on with that. Um, now that we warmed everybody up and uh, Steve Burke will be presenting and thank you so much for being there um, on the um, Evan I master series forum digital age on April 6th and 7th. I'm telling you, you're going to hit it hard and it's going to be great to have you there um, and be a part of what we're doing together. We're joining forces, automotive dealers, as well as Agora and other allied industry uh, professionals coming together, thought leaders and process leaders, just bringing this home. So um, with that, I think we have one more comment. The Darwin menu on iPad shows how technology changes in our office, relatable to their new vehicles. Girl, you're right. Things are changing <laughs> and you have to make it relatable and you've got to make it fun. Absolutely. And love you, Becky. Steve, nice conversation and insight. Thank you, Angela.
Well, I think we did a great job tonight, Steve. Thank you again. And hopefully, you know, we help to educate some of these guys and dealers. I'm telling you right now, independent dealers, Chris, what do you, Chris, excellent live talk as always, Becky, you and Steve touched on so many imperative topics. I'm telling you right now, Chris, you need to get a hold of me. Um, I'll talk you through some of this, but um, definitely dealers, auto dealers, um, even some of our agents, feel free to reach out to me, Becky at journeyconsulting.com. And yeah, I'll be more than happy to help you with some of the details. But this, this is, this is the way of the future right here. This is it. So um, I told you, Steve, I'm so excited, excited <laughs> about um, what you're doing um, for the industry. It's, it's amazing. It's great. No, Becky. And, and thank you for helping me spread word. You know, this was great. And, and I enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing the F and I master series and it's just fantastic. And any, any opportunity I have to, to just talk about the industry, I love to do that. Well, then that means that we'll have to definitely make it a point to get you back here again on my live talk okay. with Becky Chernick. And, you know, sometimes I do specials. Okay. So that would be I, kind of I am game it? for a special. That would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? We're just getting, we're be. just getting started. We're just <laughs> getting started. So, um, guys, I want to thank you again for being here um, with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.